Anyway, today we're talking about this word empty. Empty. E M P T Y. It's a five letter word, but you know, often that word empty seems like a four letter word to us. Or maybe sometimes it tempts us to say some four letter words sometimes. Like if you're running late and you, you jump in your car and you're starting to drive and that little light comes on that says your gas tank is empty. Or you go to the ATM to get some cash and it comes back bank account empty. Or you swipe your card and it says denied. Empty is not a good feeling. Or many of us know that feeling, and particularly on holidays like this one, when we're gathered around a table and there's a chair empty. Maybe it's from a death or a divorce or an estrangement from some family or some friends. Or, or maybe it's a chair that's empty because you feel empty because you haven't found that person that you want to spend your life with yet empty. And of course, we have that old question about a glass like this. Is it half full or half empty? And you know, they say that this question can tell us a lot about ourselves. It can tell us, are we optimists or are we pessimists? But you know, it's not really a fair question because when it's asked, People want us to hear it say it's half full. They don't really want to hear us say that it's half empty. This word empty. And it's probably safe to say that most of us here, if not all of us here, have had a time in our lives where we felt empty. Whether physically or emotionally or spiritually, just drained. Like we had nothing left. And so we can understand what Mary Magdalene probably felt like as she went to the tomb that first Easter morning. Like so many others, she hoped that Jesus would be the one. That he would be the Messiah, the one to come about and restore the Israelite nation. That he would be the one that would fulfill the promises, the hopes. The hopes of the entire people that stretched all the way back to the exile. And really, those hopes that stretched all the way back to the Garden of Eden and the beginning of time. The hopes that had led the crowds to shout a few days before when he was riding into Jerusalem on the donkey. The hopes that had led them to shout, Hosanna, save us. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. But things had turned south in a hurry over the last few days. Those cries of the king, those cries of salvation, those cries of Hosanna became cries to execute this Jesus. And now he was dead. He'd been killed. But what of all those things he had said? All that talk he'd made about the kingdom of heaven, wasn't he going to establish it? Or what about that time that Peter had, had called him the Messiah and Jesus said, bless you, Peter, you got it. And wasn't it just four days ago on Thursday that he said he was the way, the truth, and the life? Were those all just empty words? Were they empty promises? Because he's dead now. And all that Mary can do for him now is one last sacred act of friendship by preparing his empty body for burial. But when she reaches the tomb, it's empty. And so even that is taken away from her. This one thing that she was planning to do to work through her grief or this one thing she was planning to do to just take her mind off of it for a little while, even that's been taken away from her. So she runs and tells a couple of the disciples and they come back with her. And they, but when they see the tomb empty, they go back home while she remains outside, heartbroken, weeping, and empty. But as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? 
She said to them, They've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. It's quite a story. In fact, it's the greatest story there's ever been and there will ever be. But you know, to be honest, we shouldn't be all that surprised that Mary found the tomb empty. And I don't just mean we shouldn't be surprised of it because most of us have heard this story before. But we shouldn't be surprised that Mary found the tomb empty because Jesus had this habit of emptying himself. He had this habit of pouring himself out. In one of the earliest hymns in the church, which Paul wrote down in the book of Philippians, Jesus' birth is described in these words. Though he was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited but emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And then it continues to describe Jesus' death like this. It says, And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Both his birth and his death are described as this emptying of God's self, God giving up, Jesus giving up everything that he had. At his birth, giving up all the glories of heaven to come down and be here with us. And at his death, giving up his earthly life for us. And it wasn't just at birth and death, it was actually all during Jesus' life that he, he continued to empty himself, to pour himself out for us always stopping when anyone needed compassion, always stopping to heal anyone in need, always stopping for anyone who needed to feel accepted. Even when he was feeling empty himself, there was that time that he just got a news that his cousin, John the Baptizer, had been killed. And so he withdrew. He went off to a quiet place where he could be by himself and grieve. But the problem was the crowd saw him going. And the crowd followed along. And even though he himself was feeling empty, Jesus stopped and began to heal them. In fact, he healed so many that it got to be late into the evening. And Jesus realized, well, they must be hungry. And so Jesus poured out his love again, feeding them all. 5,000 men plus women and children. Jesus had this habit of emptying himself, and it's a, it's a habit, a trait that he got honest. As we've seen this year in some of the stories that we've been working through in our sermon series entitled This Story, we've seen that God had this trait, or has this trait. How God can't keep God's goodness to God's self, but let it pour out, let it empty out to create the world. And then after that, God let it pour out again and again to call the world back. The stories of Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Exodus and the Mos- and, and the Exodus with Moses, all of them stories of God pouring out God's self to bring us back. It's just who God is and what God does. And so it's also who Jesus is, since Jesus is God and what Jesus does. So it shouldn't surprise us then that Mary found the tomb empty because Jesus still had work to do of emptying himself, of pouring himself out, which is what he did for Mary, 
when he called her my name, saying, Mary. And in that moment when she heard Jesus call her name, all of her emptiness was filled by the empty tomb. All of her emptiness was filled by the living Christ. So, My friends, Jesus still calls us by name. Jesus still pours himself out into our own emptiness. You know, when he rose from the grave, he, he proved that sin and death and brokenness were all overcome. All the things that make us feel empty sometimes are indeed overcome whether it's our own sin that makes us feel empty, whether it's a sin that someone commits against us that makes us feel empty, whether it's the death of a loved one or our own fears of a pending death for ourselves or someone else or any of the other brokenness that sometimes makes us feel empty, they're all overcome. And we can be filled by Christ, not just in some sweet by and by, but right here, right now, when we hear Jesus call our name. So if you're feeling empty today, you've come to the right place. To this place where we, this service where we ponder the mystery of death and resurrection. The mystery of the empty tomb. This place where we sing praises and we spend time talking to God and we spend time hearing the scripture, all things that help us hear the voice of God calling our name. That's why we offer our Sunday school classes and our book club and the other places to give us a group of people because, you know, sometimes we need someone else to help us learn how to hear God's voice. Or there are times when we're struggling to hear it and we need someone to help point it out. So if you don't have that group that can help walk beside you in faith and help you hear God's voice, I encourage you to try out some of these groups that we offer. Sunday schools at 10 o'clock. Children and youth are up at our bypass campus. A lot of our adult classes are there, but there's also an adult class here in our puppet theater through these doors and on around. Or check out our book club that's starting up in a couple weeks. Those details are in your bulletin. Well, you know, sometimes we all need somebody else help us hear God's voice. To hear God's voice so that our emptiness can begin to be filled. Which brings us back to this glass. This glass that's half full or maybe it's half empty. Or some might say that the glass is just too big. But maybe it's not. Maybe the glass isn't too big. Maybe the glass had once been full. Maybe it had once been full, but then it came across someone who was empty, someone who was thirsty. And it was willing to pour out a little of itself so that someone else could be filled. Because, my friends, that's often how God works. Pouring into us, filling our emptiness, so that we can then turn around and fill the emptiness of someone else. Do you have a story of a time when God filled you when you were empty? If you do, as a buddy of mine in seminary used to say, if you have that story then run and tell it. Because there are people who need your testimony. There are people who need to hear how God filled you so that they can find hope again. People who need to hear your story of how God filled you so their, their ears can be pricked up again so they can hear God's voice. And it might even be as you tell them your story that they hear God calling their name and they begin to be filled. We all need sometimes people who help us hear the voice of God. So if you have that story, tell it. That's what Mary did. 
when she went back after Jesus had called her name and, and that empty tomb in the presence of the living Christ had begun to fill her emptiness, she went and told the disciples. And can you imagine the joy that was in that room? So praise be to God for the empty tomb. Praise be to God for that sign that Jesus is still about emptying himself and pouring himself out so that we can be filled. And also praise be to God for those people who are willing to empty themselves to pour into others. Now I said a moment ago that if you're empty today, you've come to the right place. Because Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And those who come to me will never be hungry. And those who believe in me will never be thirsty. Mary wasn't the only person that Jesus encountered on that first Easter. Later on in the day, he, he came across a couple of disciples walking on the road from Jerusalem down to Emmaus. Disciples who, like Mary, had hoped that Jesus would be the Savior they were waiting for, but after he was killed and died, they gave up hope. So we presume they were going home. But Jesus walked up on them, and as they walked along, he began to walk them through the scriptures, how it was foretold that the Savior must come and die and be put to death and, and rise again. But still, they didn't recognize that it was Jesus. When they got to where they were going in Emmaus, they asked Jesus to stay the night because it was getting late. And he agreed. And he sat down at their table, and while he was sitting at the table, he took bread. He gave thanks to God, and he broke the bread. And as he gave it to them, their eyes were opened. And as he gave them that bread, they knew that Christ was there in their midst. So my friends, if you're feeling empty today, my prayer for you is that like those disciples in Emmaus, that you will find the presence of the living Christ in this meal. And in this meal, Christ will begin to fill that emptiness. Now we know that sometimes our emptiness comes from our own sin, our own shortcomings that come back around on us. And it's always good before we come to this table to take a moment and confess those sins before God so that we might find Christ's forgiveness. That forgiveness that was guaranteed to us when Christ rose again. So before we come to this meal, let's pray together. Eternal God, we confess that sometimes we fall short of your high hopes for us. Sometimes we know what we need to do and we don't do it. Sometimes we know what we shouldn't do, and we do it anyways, and, and God, sometimes we do it without even realizing it, not even knowing what we're doing, but we make mistakes, and we end up hurting the ones whom we love. We make mistakes, and we end up hurting people we don't even know, or before we realize that we've turned so far away from you that we can't even see anymore. Lord, regardless of the case, we're sorry. And we ask that you would, again, forgive our sins as you promised. That you would draw us back close to you. Lord, we make this prayer in the name of Jesus. The one who died for our sins. Amen.